So welcome everybody to LGBTQ 101, Creating Inclusive Spaces for ROP. Today is May 6, 2020. My name is Rob Darrow. You can see my website there and you all received an email from Mark on a document that hopefully you have access to and you're looking at now. If, you're, if you don't have this document up, please go find it. Uh, it's in your email from Mark. So it says sccoe.rop May 6th. There'll be things on this document that I'm gonna have you click into and use eventually. So if you haven't found those yet, please do so. And let's see, and now I need to go back to my other screen. So please consider this is a safe space to um, share or ask questions about anything related to the LGBTQ community and the topic today. That's the purpose of this is to, um, as you'll see from the survey that you filled out that I'll show you those results, you did a good job of, uh, many of you have knowledge of these topics, but there's always new stuff we can learn. So please consider this a safe space. So that pink triangle's important in history. Does anybody know where that pink triangle came from? No. Nope. So I'm not seeing anybody's response. So the, the pink triangle back, uh, in the Holocaust, when people went ended up in concentration camps, everybody had a different patch on the outfit they wore. And people who were designated as gay men wore the pink triangle. It's also interesting that at the end of World War II, um, for those of us who've taught history, the photo in the, <clears throat> that we often show students is the picture of Eisenhower um, liberating the concentration camps. But the group that was not liberated at the beginning was people who wore the pink triangle because being homosexual in Germany at that time was illegal. So they had to figure out how to handle that group of people that had been in concentration camps. So that's the pink triangle. Um, we've already talked about this. Um, in case you're not familiar with Zoom in the bottom left-hand corner, um, there's the mute button in this, the video and that sort of thing. It's, it's nice to see your faces. So I appreciate seeing your videos. Um, I teach a class at CSU Monterey and what I learned last week when I didn't see everybody's faces is that suddenly people disappear and I called on somebody they didn't answer and I went oh they're not really there okay <laughs> anyway <laughs> it's great to see your faces so there'll be some times during this um, workshop where you're gonna have to write some things down so if you don't have a piece of paper out or something to write with let me give you a second to grab that So now I'm going to ask you to, uh, you shared what you teach and that sort of thing, but I'd love to hear your voices um, to introduce yourself. Um, I'll start with a little bit about myself and, and then I'll ask, then I'm going to stop the recording and, and listen from all of you. But um, again, I mentioned my, my name is Rob Darrow. I grew up in Santa Cruz and um, went away to college and became a teacher. I've taught every grade level, kindergarten through doctoral level professors at different points in my career. and. Um, I moved back to the Santa Cruz area um, in my early 50s. And um, it was at that point in my life that I realized I was gay. So I came out later in life. Um, at first, I thought I was the only person like that. But since then, I've met lots of people who realize later in life that their sexual orientation is different than the one they thought they were. So um, as I was coming out, I learned a little bit more. I'd always taught history, and I learned about LGBTQ history and the implementation of the new framework across the state. So it became interesting to me. And, and since then, I've taken classes and learned a lot about teaching LGBTQ history, have written some curriculum guides for teachers. And so because of that, I've learned a lot and help schools and school districts implement the teaching of LGBTQ history. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm under contract with the county office to provide these trainings and doing other stuff related to LGBTQ students and making sure that we have safe spaces for students across the district. So um, 
I would love to, so thanks everybody for introducing yourselves. Um, I think I'll go to a bigger screen here. So you can see these slides. So, um, so our outcomes for today is to increase your personal cultural proficiency about the LGBTQ community. Um, identify what you can do to increase your professional cultural proficiency and identify what we might, how we might apply this. Oh no, I didn't change that slide. <laughs> I irritate with myself with I do that. With ROP, the ROP program, not the outdoor ed program. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, sorry about that. Um, the, um, let me get back to my present mode. And now, of course, that's all on the recording, but that's all right. That's the world we live in. So I'm sure you can all go with it. So I appreciate all this, the people that completed the surveys. There were about 12 of you that completed it. Um, so on the survey, blue was highly comfortable. Purple was very uncomfortable. So most of you fell in the, in the center, somewhere between blue and purple. So the level of understanding about gender, sexual orientation, the LGBTQ community, as you shared with in your introductions, explains what, um, why you're comfortable with the topic. So that's good. That's always the first step. And for many of you, when you know people who identify as non-binary or gay or lesbian or um, somewhere else on the gender spectrum, then, you know, it, it makes us want to learn more, right? When we interact with the people in our families or people we love, then we tend to want to better understand it. So there were only a couple areas that you said you'd like more information about in the surveys. One was strategies for addressing possible resistance from families, um, ways to support LGBTQ youth, and ways to reduce bullying throughout your classes. So we will touch on those as we go along. As I mentioned, we've got some activities, a little bit of lecture, and this is the lecture part. Um, and of course, as I've mentioned, if you've got questions as we go along, feel free to just type it in the chat room at this point. Um, or you can grab the mic and ask the question. So our challenge really is that few of us have ever studied anything about LGBT issues or history because it was not in our history textbooks. It was not in most of our schooling. It's not in credential programs or counseling or doctoral programs or teacher induction. It's not even mentioned in college history courses. So, and there's few workshops on this topic. Um, a couple of you said in your survey that you've been to some workshops on LGBTQ stuff, so that's that's good. But there are not many workshops around for everybody to even take. Our other challenge is that more students are coming out, and as some of you mentioned, students shared their gender or sexual orientation with you, and it's important to be aware of the different um, types across the spectrum of, of how people come out these days. Many youth embrace this term called gender fluidity, which is, as some people, may mention that their, their gender feels a certain way at certain ages and then it changes over time. And um, for some of us growing up in certain homes, we grew up believing there was one gender or we were had a gender and that was it. Um, but now research has showed us that people's gender can be more fluid. And it's for some people, it's more fluid than for others. We also know that from surveys that almost two thirds of LGBT students uh, report being harassed in some way, either by being teased verbally or comments made about them, or in some cases, um, more violent um, responses. Um, and then our challenge is that for everybody in education, there are all these things that people should know about. Um, we should have a common message, belief, so we know what we're talking about, common policies. We should know a little bit about gender, sexual orientation, and social emotional learning, because that those, those are some of our students. Uh, we want to learn how to be more proactive about LGBT issues, some of the myths and fear of the unknown. For teachers who teach history, they need the content knowledge of LGBT history itself. And then, you know, how do you teach with that? So um, when I work with history teachers, we focus more on that. But where those pink arrows are, that's what we're mostly focusing on today. So it's important for us to realize that there's a difference between equality and equity, and that there is really not no excellence without equity. And we haven't really talked about that until the last 20 years in education. Um, that it's one thing to, to make accommodations for students. It's another thing to have a classroom that is equitable for all students and is safe as well. Um, many of you may be familiar with the 
system that's being rolled out across California called MTSS. And with MTSS, all means all. And there was a conference of last summer and their theme was know my name, know my face, know my story. So that fits in with all of this. And whoever kids are, you know, we take kids wherever they are and move them forward with their topics. And that's part of our job. What does MTSS stand for? Um, Multi-tiered support system. And then, um, so hopefully you're familiar with the Santa Cruz County Office new strategic plan. And I'm hoping, um, Mark, were you able to send out that list of, of um, handouts to people? Uh, Rob, only if you sent that to me electronically. So it's important that we think about the, our, pers our missions as they fit to the overall strategic plan of your county office, which I know that many of you were involved in and putting together. So I appreciate those messages that you talked about sharing. Um, so I wanted to explore a little bit about identity and cultural proficiency with you. Um, and this is where on a piece of paper, I want you to write this down. If somebody walked up to you and said, who are you? What is your identity? Write down all the words right now that describe your identity. back to where it was. So I'm curious, and you can just do by a show of hands because I can see your screen. Um, how many of you, so just look at the very first word you wrote down. For the first word you wrote down, how many of you um, used your, your family status? Something about your family that I'm a mom or I'm a dad or something like that. Great, so I see about five hands on that. How many people put their gender first? How about, how about their ethnicity first? Ethnicity or race? How about religion? Couple religion, okay, couple of those. Um, so those generally are the, the top um, items that people share when, when you ask them about their identity. What's important to know about this is that if you, for LGBTQ students, their gender or sexual orientation is often at the top of their list because they're dealing with it every day. So even like right now where students are at home, we know that many students are out at school and not out at home. And so for some of them now, they're having more of a challenge being at home and not being out with their families for whatever reason. Um, but because gender and sexual orientation are such a part of their lives and they're reminded of it daily, then it tends to be the very top part of their identity. These are some of the things that differentiate people overall in our identities, education level, family background, all those things. Um, as people on in your group mentioned, we, we work to minimize these, right? We take people where they're at and help educate them and move them forward. So that's the purpose of what we do. It's important to realize, and many of you may be familiar with the term implicit bias, but we all have implicit bias and implicit bias are things that developed in our families. And some of you mentioned that in your introductions, right? You grew up with a certain religion, doing certain things in your family. You went to a certain school and teachers influenced your beliefs and your feelings about other people. And some of those comments influenced all of us as well. So it's important to realize that we all have implicit bias and to be aware of that so that hopefully we don't, it doesn't play out in a negative way for the people we work with. Um, implicit bias operates at the subconscious level. Um, for many of us, it's the things that trigger us. So if you think about those things that just really irritate you that other people do, that's your implicit bias. That's something you learned at some point that that's not right. So um, depending on, again, the family you grew up in or the family you live with now, there are certain things that are important and you determine those um, and that's our implicit bias. If you're interested in exploring more about implicit bias, if you could Google Harvard implicit bias online surveys, there's a variety of surveys around race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, um, 
generational bias. There's all different biases there. So if you want to explore that more to explore your implicit bias, you're certainly welcome to. Um, another way of thinking about this is through this cultural iceberg that I like, because for most of us, the things that are visible, even in a Zoom call like this, is when we have our cameras on, our age, the clothes we're wearing, the language we speak, the behaviors, um, our gender um, is pretty obvious. Although for some people, our, uh, if we were at a school, the gender is becoming less visible for some. Um, and then you can see the things below the, the waterline that are less visible and not visible, things like people's life experiences, people's political views, unless you share it, your personal values, your sexual identity and beliefs and things like that. If people don't share those, then you don't really know those about other people. And so as we work with students and um, young adults, uh, the groups we work with, it's important to keep in mind what we do know, what is visible and what's less visible. And is it important to know those other things as part of working with students? And in some cases they are, and other cases they're not as important. So many years ago, if you've been in education, the, the Lindsay's wrote this book called C Cultural Proficiency for School Leaders. And I just bring this up to bring forward the fact that they've also written a book called Cultural Proficiency Response to LGBT Communities. So if you wanted to read more about this topic, that's the book I would recommend that you get, Response to LGBT Communities by Randy and, and um, Dolores Lindsay, um, are a couple who've this has been their life work, cultural proficiency. When I talk about cultural proficiency, I think it's important for people to realize that most of us belong in many cultural groups. A, a culture is a group of people identified by their shared history, values, and patterns of behavior. So for example, those of you in ROP, you're a culture in yourself. There's a certain culture in the ROP. There's different cultures in different schools, and you may belong to other cultural groups, your family group, you may belong to a, a club where there's a certain culture. Um, so it's important to realize that culture is not just our ethnicity or the family we grew up in, but there are many cultures that people are involved in. And that includes the LGBTQ community to say that that's a, a culture into itself. And if you're part of that community, then you learn how to tap into that community. Um, and then proficiency is just this mindset of continuous improvement which is part of the reason for doing this with the county office. And as Mark mentioned earlier, why it's important for us to keep getting better in how we serve the, the students that we work with. This continuum of cultural competency shows on the far left side, people that are not very open-minded to the, the far right side where people are more open-minded that are open to learning about how, how better to serve the students we work with and the families we work with and, um, you can see those ranges. I think that most most of us in edu it'd be hard to be in education and not be in that kind of cultural competence direction because it'd be very difficult to work with the range of students that walk into our classrooms on a daily basis. Um, a culturally proficient leader is someone who takes responsible for their own learning, that there's some vision about how you can serve the needs of all students. Um, it's understanding cultural proficiency around race and culture and LGBTQ families, um, all the different groups of people that walk through their do your door because the more you know about the populations you work with, the better you can serve them and help them to become who they wanna be. Now in that document you hopefully filled out ahead of time, that cultural proficiency assessment, there were three different levels that I asked you to rate yourself on. There was a personal level, the professional level, and the institutional level. Now the personal really is, is how we each are and what we know about and what we choose to learn about. The professional really is the teaching that we do. And within education or teacher groups or within our classrooms, we have control over what our shared belief is and how we do that. Institutionally, that involves a lot more people than just you as the teacher um, and what you can influence. But across the ROP family, you have, conversations that you all have with Mark and, and others in ROP about how your classes are gonna be, the types of things that you do with the students and that sort of thing. So it's just important to realize these different levels that you have lots of control over your personal proficiency, some control over your professional proficiency, but not a whole lot over the institutional proficiency unless you're the person in charge, then you have a lot of control over that. So as you think about 
possibly making adjustments to better serve LGBTQ students, it's important to realize where these all fit. And so at this point, I invite you to, again, just we're building your personal proficiency at this point and think about how that can be. Now I'm gonna ask you, um, you can either look at it on your screen or follow my screen here. We're gonna talk a little bit about gender and inclusive language. And so the, the email that, that Mark sent out to you that has the links on it, know that there's a vocabulary list there. There's this gender unicorn example. So when somebody earlier said, I don't know what these words mean, know that that vocabulary list that you now have there pretty much gives you the list of all the types of terms that may come forward, but also understand that in the LGBTQ world, um, students are developing new terms that are not yet mainstream. So some student may use a term that you're not familiar with. And in those cases, then just ask the student to please define that for you or for other students. By asking the student that question, it empowers them and it also increases the education of other people around. So there's nothing wrong with asking them to please define what that is so we all have a better understanding of it. So we're talking a little bit about gender now and, and most of us, like I said earlier, grew up in families where we thought of gender as one thing, you're male or female and that's the way it is. But there's been considerable research over the last many years to indicate there's different levels of gender or different parts of gender. So there's, and again, I'm following the right side of this slide, there's your gender identity, which is male, female, um, and then there's how you express yourself. And what, how you express yourself is really the clothes you wear, the way you move, the way you interact with people, that's your gender expression. And that's different than gender identity. Then there's the sex that you're assigned at birth, for most of us, it's male or female, but some people were born as intersex, which means they were born with both male and female sexual organs when they were born. Um, just to comment about intersex, for those that may not know about that, is that traditionally um, a doctor and possibly a parent would make a decision and at, at birth as to what sex that child was going to be and then remove the organ that they decided the child was not going to be. Um, today's belief system is it's okay to be intersex. It's okay to have both male and female organs. There's nothing wrong with that. And that if people, as they get older, feel strongly one way or the other, then they can make that decision themselves. So that's a little bit about intersex. Um, there are um, probably close to five, five to 10% of our population are intersex people. The other part of gender is who we're physically attracted to. Are we attracted to men, women, or other genders, or all genders? And then are we emotionally attracted to men, women, or all genders, or some genders? So those are the four or five different aspects of gender when we think about that. Um, it's important to realize that those, um, again, this concept for most of us is new, and we haven't thought about it, but I've got another kind of a couple other um, visuals here to help think about it as well. So across the top of this screen, one end is female, the other end is, is male, and in the middle is intersex, which means it's a person, again, like I mentioned, that has both male and female sex organs. On the left side, people can feel like a man or a woman, or they can be gender fluid somewhere in the middle. Across the bottom, how, they, how you present yourself as feminine or masculine or something neutral, um, or I think androgynous, the, the top term that would mostly be used now is, is closer to non-binary would fit in there. And on the right side, you can see again, attracted to women, attracted to men, or attracted to many group. Um, students, sometimes you hear younger people use the term pansexual or polyamorous, which means that they're attracted to male and fem to men and women. Um, and then you can see the, this, diagram in the middle as well. So again, you have access to these slides so you can go back and look at them. And of course, we're recording this so we can, you can also listen to the recording later on as well. And, the, um, and then just one other graphic that I wanted to show you is that, um, darn it, I'm sorry, click too fast. 
again, just another graphic to show the different aspects of gender and where sexual orientation, gender, and how people are born fits together. So it's important as we work with students and we think about the documents we put forward for our different programs, the terms we use. And again, you have this document and I'll make sure that Mark has the email and he can email it out to you just with the documents so you have them. But um, I work with a safe schools project across Santa Cruz County and, and our job is really to help schools and school districts to better understand LGBTQ people and, and how to best support them. And this document helps you to think about instead of calling somebody or saying sexual preference or homosexual, it's better to say things like sexual orientation. That for transgender students, rather than saying real sex or real gender, you can talk, you can call them transgender or sex assigned at birth. Although I will tell you that people who have transitioned from male to female or female to male um, prefer to be called male or female um, generally. But again, it gets back to that person. And when in doubt, ask the person for their personal pronouns or identity. And regardless of the person's age, trust that that person knows who they are, no matter how old they are, whether they're five years old or 50, we just trust and believe the people and whatever they say to us. So those are um, some of those bits and pieces that I wanted to share. And I, I wanna stop at this point, and I'm gonna stop my sharing here for just a, a minute and, and ask you for any thoughts that you have at this point. So now I want to touch a little bit about on laws and policies. So um, across Santa Cruz County, um, we give out what's called the California Healthy, Healthy Kids Survey every other year. And through our county office, we've disaggregated that data based on LGBT and non-LGBT students. About six years ago on that survey, they started asking the question about sexual orientation and gender identity of students. So I, I would say that if you give out surveys to students, if you don't ask those two questions, you're not going to be able to know this because that's part of our challenge is we don't know who, which students are LGBTQ and which aren't. But, but when we look at this across our county and we get results like this, this, this is the question about suicide. You can see that there's, you know, close to 30% difference between LGBT and non-LGBT about those who have thought about suicide in the past year. And then a second question I pulled out was this one about being harassed or bullied because you were gay or lesbian or someone thought you were. And again, you see a similar 30% gap between that. We also know from research that the more that we address it and talk about it, the less it becomes an issue, right? As the more we normalize it, like um, was just mentioned, similar to the our student, if we have our own children that are probably 30 or, or younger, they've just grown up with this kind of gender fluid mentality and everything's fine. Um, and the more we normalize and talk about that in our classrooms, the easier it is for everybody to talk about it. And these types of statistics will go down as well. But if we don't address it, it won't change. That's the other important piece to know. Um, so, um, and just in case you didn't know, when we pass laws in about curriculum or what teachers teach, our legislature passes laws and the governor's sign, and then it comes down to us through different ways. And school boards generally adopt policies, improve textbooks and courses and curriculum. I say that because when we think about what we teach across Santa Cruz County or what you teach in your program, somebody made that decision on the front end. Well, the same thing is true about these laws that I'm gonna share with you next, because these laws were passed to protect students across California. And, um, we are the only state that has all of these, these laws in place. Um, in 2011, we passed the, the Fair Education Act, which says that if you teach any history, it should, it should be inclusive of LGBT history. And if you teach health and sex ed, it should include being inclusive sex ed, and that it should include discussions about being gay or lesbian or transgender, that within those classes, those conversations should be taking place. And, there are laws that have been passed that protect you if you're out at school, um, that you can't be discriminated against because you say you're gay and 
things like that. And then it was in 2018 that we passed, the state passed this Gender Recognition Act, which added non-binary to birth certificates and driver's licenses. So students may legally change their birth certificate and when they get driver's license may choose non-binary as an option. And you might be interested to know that um, in college applications now, students can, would designate non-binary as their gender as well. So know that it's there as well. So those are the laws. Uh, just a little touch on the, the stuff that hits our curriculum, the Health, Healthy Youth Act. Um, said, you know, healthy students who learn and achieve in safe and healthy environments, nurtured by caring adults, function better within our schools. That's what the California Healthy Youth Act, which is why in those classes now, gender, gender expression, and gender identity should be taught. Um, across Santa Cruz County, it's taught by many teachers who teach health and sex ed. Um, some haven't quite become comfortable with teaching it, but the law says that they will over time. Um, the Fair Education Act in 2011 said that we, and when we teach history, it should include LGBTQ students. That's pretty much what that slide says. And in case you're interested, the state history framework says that these are the grade levels when we should specifically address LGBTQ history beginning at the second grade. And in second grade, I used to teach second grade many years ago, um, we would always do a, a unit on families, right? And when we talk about families today, we should be talking about families that could have two moms or two dads or grandparents or lots of different groups of families um, and not what many of us grew up with believing is the nuclear family with a mom and dad and kids, right? So there's all different families out there. So for second grade teachers, when they talk about families, it should include other representations other than that nuclear family. And you can see other topics that are taught in different history classes is there. And again, that's just for your interest so that you can see that. Um, the state science framework also ad addresses access and equity. Every one of our state frameworks now has the access and equity cha chapter, which points out that when you recognize who students are, who they are, um, their sexual orientation, gender identity, they develop more positive self images. Now, you know, you don't just throw in talking about being gay or lesbian, it's got to fit in with the curriculum in some ways. And in the different areas that you teach, it could be bringing forth, you know, um, people in the field that you teach that may be gay or lesbian or people in, um, that might become uh, considered experts in those areas. So I'm gonna have you do an activity um, and to learn a little bit more about LGBTQ history. And we're specifically gonna use the new Santa Cruz Ma Queer History Santa Cruz online exhibit in here. And I see I've got 15 people in here. So I'm gonna go through the instructions and then I'm gonna trust that one person in each group will be able to access this, but you can access it individually or as a group. Um, so in just a minute, I'm going to put you in Zoom breakout rooms, which is gonna put you in another room with a group of two other people. Um, and before you move into those rooms, I'm gonna to say to you, okay, you're group one, so you're gonna focus on coming out in the 1960s. And when I say use this timeline, when you click on that link there, or you can also click on it on the agenda document, when you click on this timeline, it's this timeline here. So here's the Queer Santa Cruz timeline. That, and again, you're gonna be looking at this. When you look at this timeline, I just want you to look at it and see what jumps out to you. And you can do this, this as a group or individuals when I put you into groups. What jumps out to you about the 50s and 60s or what jumps out to you about the 70s or the 80s or any of those types of things. So that's one part of what you're gonna do. And then the other part is, in the overall exhibit, the queer history exhibit, there's all these different sections here. So for some of you, I said, you're gonna use groups and organizations. So you're gonna look at the timeline, then you're gonna look at groups and organizations and read the section that I'm assigning to you and see what jumps out. The goal here is that when you're finishing your smaller group here, that you're gonna share something back with the rest of us that jumped out as something interesting or something that you'd like to share with the group. So that's... Uh, 60s were definitely the time of change. And um, 
it was uh, uh, finding out that it was illegal to be gay or um, or lesbian. And it was the time of being in the closet that I think a lot of us were very familiar with. That term. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, group two, any ahas from you? I'm not sure who's gonna be the speaker, but we um, saw that um, the, the, the people that were, you know, that did the, it was in 1975, um, 200 people, um, came out in a group in Santa Cruz and they noted that they weren't looking for tolerance but they were looking for acceptance um, and another note they stated was little did we know that this would lead to legal marriage during the Obama administration um, anybody else in our group we were talking about how we um, we all at those at that time how old we were and how aware we were. Some of us were aware and some of us were not aware at all of what was going on. Great, anybody else from group two? All right. Group My addition, uh, I Go was ahead. in two. I added it from the uh, ethnic point of view because of being aware of so many issues <coughs> in the uh, black community it was a time of the cutting edge of change of all of the issues. And uh, uh, coming from uh, Alabama to New York, uh, to Rhode Island, to California, those same issues never stopped being issues and uh, being uh, uh, aware that everything is, uh, first of all, agreed Gen uh, gender comes second, but ethnicity usually came first in the black community. And so to have the stigma of being black and gay was a double win. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. All right, uh, group three. Group three, the 1980s uh, mm -hmm. and the HIV AIDS epidemic. We, uh, we discussed that it was wrongfully termed uh, the gay disease at that time. Mm -hmm. Until people like Magic Johnson announced that he had contracted HIV uh, and Freddie Mercury of Queen died of AIDS. And then there was a different take when people like Arthur Ashe contracted HIV through a blood transfusion. So now it became an issue where, well, maybe it's not just a gay disease. Maybe it's a human disease and we need to deal with this. Um, I wasn't familiar with uh, Anita Bryant's Save Our Children campaign, but I'm sure it had something to do with um, being afraid of the influence of a gay person on younger people. And Boy I'm sure- Boycott Florida Orange Juice was a big campaign. Is that right? Spokesperson yeah. for Florida Orange Juice, and it was like, don't buy Florida Orange Juice because she was, um, if you did not believe in her- Oh, wow. Yeah. I remember, I remember really that. Distinctly. I do remember the orange juice, but not that they boycotted it. Yeah. Th thanks for sharing that. I did not know that. Wow. Um, and then, you know, wow. gay teachers, like I said, my 20 year career, I've, I've had many gay colleagues who are fantastic teachers. So I'm not sure what the issue was there, but I'm sure it has something to do with influence over, over young people and the fear of that. Uh, Harvey Milk, great story um, with his influence on Castro Street in San Francisco and uh, working in the local uh, political scene and unfortunately losing his life. I believe the San Francisco airport has been renamed the Harvey Milk Airport or at least a wing of the airport. Uh, John Laird, uh, Santa Cruz mayor at least once or maybe multiple times, still influential in the area and um, so that's what we remember about the 1980s and the HIV AIDS campaign. Great, uh, group four, which one did, oh, you were doing youth in schools, right? Anybody from group four? Is the 2000s group four? Yes. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I did not know what number we were. Okay. Um, yeah, we just looked at policies and, and stuff. Um, 2000s was an, um, 
you know, there was, it was uh, a really big time for uh, trying to put this stuff into law now and, and uh, get up at the policy level. So we saw uh, sex ed laws starting to happen in the early 2000s, as well as anti-harassment and bullying laws throughout the uh, uh, early 2000s. Um, uh, of course, we had many marriage law attempts. There was the one in 2003 that the governor uh, vetoed. Then we had a five month period in 2008, which started actually on my 12th birthday, which is cool. <laughs> and, um, and then we finally got recognized in 2013, I think, from uh, the, the uh, US Supreme Court uh, as well. But um, so it was just a really big time for law, which I think reflects the entire United States because I think Matthew Shepard's law was also during that time. Uh, or the 2000s. So we, uh, it was the time of starting to get this stuff into policy and the back and forth of, of that, uh, that relationship. Great. So that was awesome. Awesome reporting, all of you. Great job. So just to share a few final slides here with you. Um, so the term LGBTQ, um, you can see the different years that the, each type of a term came into being. Um, the term LGBTQ is the term that was used in the history social science framework. Know that LGBT or LGBTQ, that term is fine. Um, locally, you may find some people that say, well, no, it should be LGBTQIA or LGBTQ plus. And because the language is evolving, that's gonna continue to evolve, but know that there's a national group that tells um, media people that the terms every year and LGBTQ is the current terminology. Um, and just for the record, so everybody knows, there's always been an LGBT history. Historians have documented same-sex same love in every culture and history, ancient Greece, Native Americans. From the scientific perspective in 1919, this guy, Magnus Hirschfeld, began to talk about different um, sexual orientations, and in, in, in particular, transgender people. But because of the Nazi Holocaust, all of his lab and books were burned down and he fled uh, Germany and lived out the rest of his life someplace else like many people did. The whole history of LGBTQ people was not really written down until 1976 in this book called Gay American History. So um, just know that LGBTQ history is alongside other histories like African American history, Latinx history, women's history, all those different histories. And across the universities, um, a group came together in the 1990s at UCSC and decided that this broad term should be called queer history or queer studies because the term queer is the umbrella term that covers all this area. So um, I realize that for some older queer people, they don't like that term queer, but the academics have adopted it. So we've adopted it for the exhibit as well. Um, also know that being LGBTQ is determined at birth. It's not a choice. Um, there's lots of documentation about that as well. Overall, the way, the reason for doing this is we want students to be more engaged in school, to be more successful. And then, you know, everybody has a, their own history to share. And so it's great when you can bring that out when that works for all of you. Know that some people get these things mixed up in the communities. And those of you that are concerned about how do you, um, deal with resistance, well, this is the way we deal with it, is we point out that we teach LGBT history, that we, um, that there are lesbian and gay and transgender and bisexual people in our schools and in our community, and that we teach all people, and that's what we do. But sometimes people get these things mixed up, the difference between advocating a lifestyle or promoting a religion. So sometimes you have to remind people of that, and sometimes, in some cases, and you refer that to your, um, supervisors and and talk about those things as they go um, we've talked about um, the santa cruz history and the exhibit and the overall um, exhibit that's up there and um, at this point i want to just check in with i'm going to just share this final slide and see to let you know that there's lots of ways you can be proactive through your policies through the things that you put up in your office space or on your desk just in your power of your presence and i realize that in rop you don't necessarily interact with all groups across a school, but if you ever get a chance to attend a GSA club or the LGBTQ club, just to show your presence, uh, students really appreciate that. 
Um, just keep learning about what's going on. Um, if we were in normal times, I'd say come out to Santa Cruz Pride in June, but we're not doing those kinds of gatherings this year. Uh, but I invite you to continue to promote inclusive and equitable schools every day in the words and in your actions of what you do. And, um, and I'll just put this slide up here to say that if you've got other questions, feel free to send me an email or reach out to Mark who can then reach out to me. On that agenda, there's a, a quick survey for this um, presentation. I appreciate you filling that out. And at this point, I wanna thank you for